For the last several weeks, uh, we have been marching through uh, the Gospel of St. Mark, and Jesus has been addressing some very difficult subjects. He's talked about the seriousness of sin, and said, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. He's talked about divorce, that there isn't any. And uh, made all of us who have been divorced quite queasy. And today, he talks about money, and he makes an extraordinary demand. A young man ran up to Jesus and fell at his knees. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God himself. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And his answer is really good. Teacher, the young man declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. And St. Mark says that Jesus looked at the young man and loved him. Now hold on to that. He loved him. One thing you lack, Jesus said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. And at this, the young man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. So money turns out to be a problem. It turns out to be a difficult spiritual problem. Harvard Medical School psychologist Stephen Burglass has written a book called The Success Syndrome. And in his research, Burglass found that individuals who, in his word, suffer from success have a great deal of arrogance and a sense of aloneness. Inside trader David Levine was asked by his wife why he needed money from insider trading, and Levine had really no answer. Levine says that when its income was $100,000, he hungered for it to be $200,000. When he was making a million dollars, he desperately wanted to be making $3 million. Burglass says, oddly enough, people who find that $200,000 a year didn't make them happy never ask themselves why they thought $400,000 would make them happy. They just want it. Now, asked to dis prescribe a cure for the success syndrome, Burglass uh, said, what's missing in these people, Ivan Boski, Michael Milken, Leona Helmsley, uh, David Levine, is a deep commitment or religious activity that goes far beyond just writing a check to a charity. Now, Jesus is making an incredible demand on the wealthy. And uh, he tells his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples are amazed at his words. This was a contradiction of everything they'd been taught. And let me remind you about that. In the Old Testament, especially in the book of Job, but it's also in Isaiah and in the Psalms, wealth and material goods were considered a sign of God's favor. So that if you were wealthy, it must have been because God loved you and was blessing you. And Jesus seems to want to demolish this idea forever. He says, it is easier for a camel to grow, go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And for years, I thought that it meant it was impossible. And then I began to hear that some people think that in the, in the wall of the city of Jerusalem is a tiny gate called the eye of a needle. And I've never really been able to track this down, but the eye of a needle was so narrow and so low that the only way to get a camel through it was on his knees. And you can imagine, the camel would not really be too enthused about this, but a camel could be made to get on its knees and kind of crawl forward through the eye of the needle. <laughs> Hence the saying. Uh, it, 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 it's it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Which meant it wasn't impossible, but yeah, the, like the camel, the rich man had to really, really want to get through the eye of the needle.
And so the disciples, in response to that, ask, then who can be saved? Only those that really want to be. And Jesus says, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So you and I cannot save ourselves. We have to depend on God. We have to depend on Him to humble us to get through that problem. And so the, the first thing we really have to be honest about today is money and wealth. And I'm going to start by telling you something that sounds wrong until you start to think about it. It just doesn't sound right. And what I'm going to tell you is that you and I are rich, every one of us. Now, if you're comparing yourself to Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, that's the wrong standard. Compare yourself to people living in Somalia or the Sudan. Half the world, you know, a good part of the world, goes to bed hungry. Almost none of us do that. Almost none of us do that. We enjoy uh, blessings that in any other age would mark us as extremely wealthy. Uh, now, I know, I know this is a tough year financially. Uh, millions of people are out of work. Uh, uh, Trinity Church is running a significant deficit. Uh, it's been a very hard year for many people. And, uh, I mean, there are all sorts of homes that have been foreclosed on, and it's a, it's a very difficult time. But, but step back from the immediate uh, economic crisis and think about just the physical blessings that we enjoy as a, as a matter of routine. You and I can walk out of this building and get in our cars and drive almost anywhere. Almost every one of us has a telephone on our hip. Almost every one of us, if we have to, can have surgery at one of a nearby hospital to repair any number of physical difficulties. Every one of us uh, can sit and watch TV this afternoon. Every one of us has running water in our homes and electricity in our homes. You and I can buy a ticket for an airplane and be on the other side of the planet by the, almost in 24 hours. 